but yeah, because there is a quiz, there's obviously no um, warm up. So we're just gonna get into the brain again. So let's do that. So we have been talking about the cerebrum. And we're gonna continue talking about the cerebrum, but we're almost done with the cerebrum. Again, we talked about the cerebral cortex, which is the gray matter just on the surface. And then there is also the deeper pockets of gray matter. And that's what I wanna bring up right now. We, have the, we call them the nuclei. Remember, cell bodies um, down deeper in the brain are the nuclei. So if, if this was the brain, the deeper nuclei would be, you'd have to dig and find them. You know, they're like, there's like the lentiform, the caudate, the amygdala. Those you would only see if you cut the brain open. Like if I cut the brain and I look at the two hemispheres, this blue stuff that I drew is, you know, inside. You know, there's the cortex, the gray matter, that's the cortex. And then there's this gray matter that is the deeper nuclei. Um, let me get a smaller one. Lentiform nucleus gets its name lentiform because it's kind of lens shaped. Caudate nucleus. Caudate means tail-like. It looks more like a big tail. Um, the caudate and the lent and the lentiform is made out of subparts like the putamen, the globus pallidus. Like for this class, you don't need to know the details. Um, caudate and the lentiform together. Something we call like the basal nuclei. Basal meaning kind of deeper down near the base. Nuclei, they're nuclei. That's the definition of you know cell bodies in the CNS. Um, basal nuclei. Also, this whole area is sometimes called the corpus striatum. It means striped body, and it's because you've got like white matter, gray matter, white matter, gray matter, white matter. So just um, anatomically, it looks kind of striped. It goes white, gray, white, gray, white, gray. So corpus striatum. So when you're reading about this region, sometimes I call it the corpus striatum or the basal nuclei. Um, I should also say historically, they have been called the basal ganglia. Even though, not gangia, ganglia. Um, officially, properly, ganglia should only refer to things outside of the CNS with the current terminology, but it's just been used so long and it's so common that it's just used all the time. So often these basal nuclei, this is kind of the modern proper um, terminology, but they're still called basal ganglia all the time. So you need to know that term. And again, corpus striatum is also a term. And what is it doing? They seem to be involved with motor, uh, modulating motor function.
you know, when I say modulate, it's more kind of adjusted rather than like the primary motor cortex where it's kind of directly controlling, kind of turning on muscles and stuff. Like when you have dysregulation of the basal nuclei, for instance, in Parkinson's disease, you know, you're not paralyzed as much as like you have tremors. You can't like make your things just settle in and sit in a, where you want them to be. You can have trouble starting and stopping motions, things like that. Um, sometimes, like when you're looking at the side effects of different antipsychotic drugs, they'll talk about extra pyramidal symptoms. So extra pyramidal is referring to motor pathways that are not like the pyramids, not the things that are coming straight out of the motor and the primary motor cortex. So extra pyramidal symptoms are dysregulating things more in this area. And that is where you have people having, like where they can't stop moving their fingers. Like they have things they call pill rolling. Like people have side effects where they just keep moving their fingers, keep letting their tongue go out in and out of their mouth or have trouble, again, get stuck and can't move or, you know, things like that. Um, so sometimes the other word they use often for these kind of symptoms is tardive dyskinesia. Tardive meaning late onset because the symptoms don't happen until after you've been taking these antipsychotic drugs for a while. Dyskinesia means messing up your movement. So the tardive dyskinesia is these extra pyramidal symptoms seem to be more about dysregulating more of these deeper gray matters that are modulating motor stuff. Um, so that's a big part of what these deep, you know, deeper gray matters are doing. I think trying to like in kind of gate gating, there's different signals coming down to operate your body, your physical body and kind of gating what's actually controlling and not controlling things. Um, there's one other pocket of gray matter that is not doing this. It's called the amygdala. Um, it, it comes from the word for almond. It's kind of like the size and shape of an almond or so. Again, it's gray matter kind of like here on the end of this caudate nucleus there. The amygdala is, gets a lot of attention because it is activated when people are you know, feeling fear or anxiety. It's one of the few, like we'll talk a little more about emotions in a little bit. Um, and in general, it's kind of hard to know what exactly does it mean in your brain when you're feeling happy or sad or jealous or whatever. But there is more of a direct correlation between activity in the amygdala and sensing um, fear and anxiety. So it's something that, and in this, the studies that I'm doing, that's one of the places that I'm looking to see if there's less activity in the amygdala in a certain condition after they've gone through therapies that are designed to make them less anxious. Um, you know, so it's something people look at a lot, partly because it's a place we can look. Um, it's kind of like, I was thinking about that old story about like the guy looking for his keys under the, under the street light and somebody's like, why did you drop your keys down here? It's like, no, I don't know where I dropped them, but this is where there's light. So I'm going to look here. Um, so yeah, trying to understand emotions in the brain. It's really much unknown about it, but people look here a lot because it's the one thing where we actually do have some ability to um, see things that we expect. Um, you know, I, yeah, I'm looking at the time. The amygdala is, is interesting in lots of ways. Um, 
there seems to be there seems to be just kind of a core activation when I, I'll, I'll just I think this is useful thinking about the neural bases of some of the things that are bizarre and just kind of human culture and society I think is useful the idea of like in group out group You know, in group is kind of your tribe. Out group is somebody from outside your tribe. Um, they have found that just how you look at pictures and how if you like look at pictures of people and you classify them more by it could be racial stuff or it could be socioeconomic stuff or this or that that there tends to be this kind of natural amygdala activity when your things are more outgroup. It's like, if, if you go back in like little tribes of hominids living in some little valley and some new, new creatures coming over the hillside and you're like, should I be nervous here that they're coming for my food or my mates or something? You know, there's this natural turning on of some anxiety which is not necessarily a bad thing. It's like, oh, I've got to check things out here. Um, but if you classify the same images based on things like, what kind of hobby do you think this person has? Or you, 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 you rather than classifying them by these kind of groups, you classify them more about just personal things. You tend to not have the same amygdala activity show up in these brain scans. So it's kind of fascinating just just how you look at some at, at, at a new person and what kind of things, what kind of information you're kind of trying to extract from looking at them and trying to figure out who this person is has an, has an effect on whether there's this innate kind of anxiety or not. Um, I mean, and ha again, having anxiety or fear is not a bad thing. There's this woman who had bilateral amygdala damage just genetically. And she ended up becoming this famous, um, famous experimental subject because it's like, okay, what does it look like if somebody doesn't have amygdalas? You know, and in general, she did, she was you know, pretty normal, but just really very adventurous because things didn't really like, really like set her back. And but when they would show her pictures of like, you know, You know, you know, who 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 would you rather take home, you know, go home with from the bar? It's like, oh, they both look like to be fun. <laughs> you know, it's like she didn't have her little spidey sense of like, ugh, you know, this I'm I I'm uncomfortable here or something's wrong. <laughs> you know? So I mean having the amygdala is not a bad thing. It's just you want to be able to modulate. It's it's kind of like in all this. You know, those Buddhist practices, like things are going to arise, but then you can choose what do you do with what comes up, you know? So amygdala. Question? What's that? I have a question. So people that have like high anxiety or like chronic anxiety, is that dealing with the amygdala? Like, is that like something that's like affect, is that why it's effective or? Um, you know, it's, there's probably lots of things going on there, but Definitely, it's related to that. Like having, um, like one of the, again, the thing that I'm looking at in my study is there's these prefrontal areas that we talked about being more about executive decision making. There are these deeper limbic areas they're called that are about emotions and how much control, how much you have an ability to modulate um, that depends, like there's this idea, the, the thing that, I, that I'm studying in particular is called emotional regulation, which is the ability to kind of modulate what comes up. Like if you look at something and decide like, okay, this is, this is a little disturbing, but I'm gonna like try to put a positive spin on this, try to not get so um, upset by this, you know, that's emotional regulation. And 
some people can do that just natively better than others. Like in our study, after doing this MDMA-assisted psychotherapy, people are better at this. They are able to see the same, you know, see the same kind of more emotionally charged, disturbing images and not have as much amygdala activity um, if they're trying to stay more grounded and less spun out by things. So um, I would say it's most likely related, but then it's also, there's lots of other things going on in, in addition to that. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, so amygdala, we'll come back to the amygdala in a little bit when we talk about different regions of the um, brain involved in emotions. Um, you know, the one other thing I'll mention, hippocampus. This is going to come up. Hippocampus is going to come up in both talking about memory in a little bit, because it's necessary to what we call consolidate memories, to take memories from short into long term. It's also important as a key part of your limbic system emotions. Um, this is kind of in the floor of floor of the um, temporal lobe. It gets its name because it's gray matter that kind of looks like this. It kind of has these little horns and it's, it, does anyone know what hippocampus means? What is a hippopotamus? Fat animal. <laughs> a, a, hippo, a hippopotamus is a river horse. A hippocampus is a seahorse. So people thought it looks kind of like a seahorse. So it gets the name hippocampus. Um, but we will we'll, we will be meeting the hippocampus in a couple of contexts um, as we go on today. And again, it's just more gray matter. in the floor of the temporal lobe, and it's gonna play important roles. Um, it does lots of things in addition to those, but those are a couple of the things it does. Um, okay, so cerebrum and cerebral hemispheres. Yeah, it's doing a lot of the core, especially most of the higher higher processing you think of, you know, all of this kind of looking at the world around you, making sense of what it all means, deciding what to do about it. Um, so that is cerebrum. Cerebrum is, is more, you know, about figuring out like, how am I going to pass this quiz today? Um, as we start getting further down, we start getting into more autonomic stuff. Um, although for, first step, first, yeah. So what's the next step down from the cerebrum? As we continue down, what do we get to? Midbrain? Not quite. There's something before the midbrain. Oh, <clears throat> Yeah, the diencephalon with the thalamus, hypothalamus, epithalamus. So let's look at that now. So let's start with the thalamus. You know, the thalamus does have a variety of things, but we're going to give it, it's one of its core um core jobs which is to be kind of a sensory relay uh oh did i just lose i just lost this thing didn't i Ack. my apologies here oh man all right this is going to take me a second because this completely, completely knocked me out. 
That's weird. My apologies. While I type this in, you can take a break. All right, so here was my brain, the cerebrum, then we're gonna have thalamus. Thalamus, this is where most of the senses first synapse before going into the cortex. So thalamus, so it's kind of like the gateway to the cerebrum. It's like sensory relay station. Like all of your visual information comes in, synapses in here and then goes off you know, there's an area called the lateral geniculate nucleus where all your visual information first connects and then goes into your occipital lobe primary visual cortex. All of your auditory information goes into another, the medial geniculate nucleus before going off into your auditory cortex and your temporal lobe. So this is where the senses first come in, synapse, and then kind of get distributed into different regions in the cerebrum. Um, there's, you probably have some perception that there's some kind of thing happening, but you don't really have in, that much information yet about what, what you're seeing or hearing or anything until it gets into the cerebrum and kind of processed and integrated. Um, so let's just leave there, leave it there. The thalamus is going to be our gateway to the cerebrum. And we should let me give us context here. The little area right above the thalamus is called the epithalamus. Epi meaning above the thalamus. Um, the epithalamus has really one main claim to fame. It's where you find the pineal gland. Pineal means little pine cone. It looks like a little pine cone. Um, historically, it's kind of interesting because it's one of the only unpaired um, structures in the brain. Most of uh, most almost everything in the brain has a right and a left. There's a right and left thalamus, a right and left this and that. Um, but there's just kind of one pineal gland that's kind of in the center of the brain there. Um, so like Rene Descartes, like you know, hundreds of years ago, thought, well, oh, that must be like the seat of the soul, because it's the one place where it's just kind of this unique piece of the brain. Um, but we now know that's not true. <laughs> it's, it's like a place where you make melatonin. Um, which is a hormone. Um, it's involved with circadian rhythms. Spell rhythm. Um, day night cycling, um, it goes up and down through the course of the day. Um, if you take melatonin, it makes you tired. Um, in other non-human animals, it's involved with um, kind of mating as well. Like most, most animals have more limited periods where they're receptive to mating, like, you know, go into heat. 
like you know humans have more kind of any time but in the animals that are more have these specific periods when they're receptive to mating the melatonin plays a role in um, pacing that as well um, you know, some people, like there's there's people who talk about the pineal gland making DMT in this. Like DMT is found in the brain, but some of the stuff, some of the stuff out there, but the pineal gland doing all these amazing things is like purely speculative. <laughs> it's you have to be careful about trusting everything you read. Um, pineal gland epithalamus also has a. Um, choroid plexus up in there. Does anyone, does everyone remember what does a choroid plexus do? CSF. Yeah, so this is one of the places where CSF is being produced. It's actually right on the roof of the third ventricle. The two thalami make the two walls of the third ventricle with the space in between being filled with CSF. So the roof of the third ventricle is the, is the epithalamus. So the choroid plexus is basically like a little sprinkler system on the roof of the third ventricle making um, CSF in there. Um, and then the other part of, and this, again, everything we're talking about right now is the diencephalon. The diencephalon is the thalamus, the epithalamus, and then the hypothalamus. So hypo meaning below the thalamus. It's also a little anterior towards the front. Um, hypothalamus does all sorts of stuff. Um, it is a major um, coordinator of autonomic functioning. And it's also very much involved in emotions. And it's also the go-between between, between the nervous system and the endocrine system. So let's, let's talk about all of those. Um, so one thing here is it connects to the pituitary gland. So the hypothalamus basically controls the pituitary gland. We're gonna talk about that in much more detail later when we talk about the endocrine system, we'll talk about how it controls it and the different hormones involved in that process. But for right now, let's just say it controls the pituitary gland and the pituitary gland we'll see is something of a master gland that controls lots of other glands. It controls your thyroid gland, your adrenal glands, um, your gonads. Um, so by controlling the pituitary gland, it's basically the nervous system is pulling a lot of strings over the endocrine system in general. So, you know, it's not that surprising that your stress which is more of a psychic thing, ultimately affects your hormonal levels of like cortisol and stuff and depresses your white blood cell count. You know, so there is this very direct connection between your brain, but then the um, endocrine system and the hormones that are controlling all of these different processes, including like, you know, immune function and stuff like that. So hypothalamus, is this bridge between the th nervous system and the endocrine system. Also lots of autonomic functioning. Um, temperature control. It's where you have your thermostat. Um, cardiovascular and respiratory control. Um, we're going to see there are other 
places that are doing this kind of stuff as well when we get down into the um, brainstem, like the medulla and the pons, but those are still modulated by the hypothalamus. So, um, and again, like I said, the idea of having your brain connected to this stuff makes sense. Like you're, you're starting to get, again, in your brain, getting nervous about something, your heart's speeding up, you're starting to pant or you're starting to hyperventilate. It's like this connection between what's going on in your mind and all of a sudden what's actually manifesting in your physical body. You know, they're, they're very connected here. Um, so there's a lot of autonomic functions that are controlled by the um, hypothalamus. Um, another, another thing that it does is, let me get rid of this so I can have more space. Kind of emotions and drives. hunger, thirst, things like that. When we, a little later on, oh, quite a bit later on, we'll talk about, you know, if your blood volume is getting too low or your osmolarity in your plasma is getting too high, it's going to trigger the hypothalamus to make you thirsty, to like dilute yourself, bring more water in. Um, you know, sex drives, um, and then emotions like um, things like fear, rage, pleasure. I'm oh, sorry, I said emotions already. So things that are more kind of drives, things that are more like emotions, those are also um, um, connected and controlled to at least to some degree by, by activity in the hypothalamus. So, and again, like I said, it's not that surprising when you think about the connection of the mind to these very like physical things. Um, again, you're, you're embarrassed and blood vessels dilate in your face and you blush, you know, it's, there's this very like direct connection between kind of sometimes what you're thinking or whatever and, and then feeling and then what's happening in your body. Um, the, I'll, I'll read this quote that I love. It's the guy, Simon LeVay, he said, people tend to stay away from the hypothalamus. Most brain scientists prefer the sunny expanses of the cerebral cortex to the dark claustrophobic regions at the base of the brain. They think of the hypothalamus, though they would never admit this to you, as haunted by animal spirits and the ghosts of primal urges. They suspect that it houses not the usual shiny hardware of cognition, but some witch's brew of slimy pulsating neurons adrift in a broth of mind-altering chemicals. Yeah, that just kind of cracks me up. Um, but yeah, it's definitely more about kind of keeping you, keeping your body alive, about more drives and things like that, rather than like, hmm, what do I do to die? Or like, how am I going to approach this particular thing in my life? Um, so, hypothalamus. You know, diencephalon, I'll mention just for completeness, is also developmentally the source of your retina in your eye. Um, the diencephalon has these little optic vesicles, which become the optic cups, which ultimately become your retina. So the retina, when we get to the eye next week, it's like a little outpocketing of the brain. Like the level, the layers of neurons in the retina do a lot of the pre-processing of the visual information before it ever gets sent down the optic nerve. So, you know, sometimes the retina, an approachable part of the brain. Um, so just, just for completeness there. Okay. Um, you know, I'll say this just because it's funny. Don't use this as your only way to remember 
the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus does lots of things. Like I said, all these autonomic functions, temperature, cardiovascular, respiratory, controlling of the pituitary and endocrine function, drives like hunger, thirst, sex, emotions, fear, rage, pleasure. Um, but there is a funny little thing that I'd be remiss not to say is people talk about the hypothalamus being responsible for the four Fs, feeding, fear, you know, feeding, fleeing, fighting, and reproduction. Um, so I think it's, I mean, that, that, that one is actually kind of useful to think of some of the stuff it does, but not everything. So don't use it as your, there's a question on your exam. You know, you'll need more than just those because there's, you know, again, that does not include at all its endocrine function, which is a critical part of what it does. Um, so hypothalamus. Again, we will meet the hypothalamus in much more detail at the end of the semester because it's a key player in the endocrine system and in the reproductive system. The hypothalamus is making gonadotropin releasing hormone, which is what is starting the monthly cycle for a woman's um, monthly, monthly, monthly reproductive cycle. It's also pulsing out for guys to make their testosterone and sperm and all that. So it's gonna be coming back on the very last week of class as a key player driving reproductive cycling. So hypothalamus. Now we're gonna get down into the brain stem. This is going to be the midbrain. And the pons and the medulla. You know, below that, you're leaving the skull and you're in the spinal cord. Right, so everything we've been talking about, the thalamus, hypothalamus, everything's up above here. So this is all the stuff from the forebrain. So now we're in the stuff from the midbrain and the hindbrain. Um, the brain stem, which is again, the midbrain and the pons and the medulla are more what people often think of as that kind of reptilian brain. Um, kind of really more kind of core reflexes and control that kind of keep your body going, um, right? If you have something stuck in your throat, you got to cough it out. It doesn't matter if you're a gecko or a human, you need to keep your airways open so you can breathe. Um, you have that kind of stuff or you got to like maintain basic blood pressure. It doesn't matter if you are a human or you're a, you know, fish or whatever. So a lot of the stuff that we're going to see down in the brainstem is more kind of fundamental to kind of keeping your body going, maintaining homeostasis and all that. So let's start with the midbrain. And again, I'll just do this kind of briefly. The midbrain, on the kind of back of the midbrain, there are what are called the inferior and superior colliculi. Um, colliculi means little hills. They look like little bumps there. Um, they also are sometimes called the corpora quadrigemina, because the four little bodies, because there's two on the top, two on the bottom, there's four together. If you've been in anatomy, you've probably heard them referred to as corpora quadrigemina, as well as the inferior superior colliculi. Um, these are auditory reflexes and visual reflexes. Partly, like you hear something and you can move to it, or like you've probably experienced this thing if 
you're about to walk into something you don't even see it but all of a sudden you're like what like you don't even know you don't even know what it is there but there's something some reflex in your body that is all of a sudden like must change course in this moment and i don't i didn't even see what it was there was just some visual thing that happened in my field of view that was about to like poke me in the face so there was some course correction that kind of reflex can be part of that. Um, also saccades. Um, a saccade is the term we use when you shift your gaze from one thing in your field of view to another. Um, it's worth knowing what a saccade is. Um, Let's say I'm looking at some room, you know, and there's stuff in the room and blah, blah, blah. If you put an eye tracker on somebody and look at where they're looking, they don't just have this smooth drifting around, checking it out. It, the eyes jump from place to place. They'll jump, boom. And then the muscles that move your eyeballs will accelerate your eyeballs and zoom, boom, land on something else interesting, land there. Kind of sit there, okay, wait, what is this thing? Boom, run over here. Each of these ballistic eye movements where they go from one point of interest to another point of fixation, that's called a saccade. And it's a complicated motor patterning, right? You've got to like think about the inertia of your eyeballs and figure out how to operate the muscles to spin the eyeball in the direction you want as fast as possible, but then have them land without oscillating. You know, that's superior colliculi are doing all this kind of calculations to operate the muscles in your eyes so you can like land them in different regions of space to make move your point of fixation. So that's what a saccade is. Um, yeah, you, in fact, if, yeah, you, 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 you constantly just jump in your around. One of the fascinating things, actually, I'll, I'll mention this because it's fascinating. When they look at people like with autism, um, you know, you put an eye tracker on them and you have them look at a face. You know, normally if somebody is looking at a face, 9 they saccade to the places on the face where they're gonna kind of get information about that person's emotional state, their eye or their mouth. You know, they, they basically, spend their time looking at the parts of the face that are going to be most relevant for kind of nonverbal clues of, of things. If you have somebody who is kind of autistic, they tend to just like, just land on random places on the face. They don't have that same kind of intuition or kind of just natural propensity to look at these, look at the eyes, look at the mouth, try to figure out what is this other person's internal state based on these clues on their expression. So it's, it's kind of an interesting and interesting data point when you, I mean, it's, you know, because one of the things that, you know, part of having that is you're not as good at, at, you know, intuiting other people's internal states and they don't even have this, you know, they often don't have that basic, intuition about where to go to intuit that state from that person. Whereas you don't, you're not thinking, you know, most people don't think about like, oh, I should probably look at their eyes and their mouth and try to get a sense of what is going on inside them. You just kind of do it norm, you know, naturally, but not all people do that as naturally. Um, all right. So, quick question. Yeah. Um, you were talking about saccades uh, coming out of the midbrain. Is that, 
Yeah, so you that's can what, take... That's where it happens, basically. I mean, I'm sure it happens in lots of parts it, of the but brain. But that's where, but... like, if you, if you um, take an electrode and you gently stimulate the superior colliculi up here, there's a map, talk about mapping. There's a mapping of visual space there. And they do it on like a monkey and you can just make their eyes land on any part of visual space, depending on what little part of the superior colliculi you're electrically stimulating. So there are little motor programs built in there to make the eye fixate on one or another coordinate in space. And it's, you were saying mapping, so it really would be almost as straightforward as you poke the lower left quadrant and the eyes will dart somewhere down there. I mean, roughly yeah. speaking. Yeah, something like that. That's yeah. wild. Yeah, it's wild. Um, more things in the midbrain. Midbrain is where we find the corpus, um, I mean, the substantia nigra. So let me put that in here. I'll type it in black. So midbrain also has, so it has the inferior superior colliculi, it also has a substantia nigra. Substantia nigra, it means black substance. There's melanin in there. That's a um, precursor to help make dopamine, um, but it looks dark anatomically. Main thing to know about substantia nigra is it projects up into the basal nuclei and helps regulate. So projects means it has axons that go up and connect. So projects into the basal nuclei, releases dopamine. Um, the reason why we care is this is the area that degenerates during Parkinson's disease. So We'll talk a little more. Nobody's exactly sure exactly why it happens, but they know it does happen. These neurons start dying here. And normally they go into the basal nuclei, release dopamine there. Seems to be more of an inhibitory thing. Um, as these are no longer doing their job, you start getting this dysregulation of the basal nuclei, which we talked about modulating motor function. That's where you start getting like the unstoppable tremors, or sometimes they call it like cogwheel motion, like it's hard to start and stop, like you can't just smoothly move kind of. <laughs> um, so there are other, so there's, there's very obvious motor things. Some, eventually people get like a mask like face and things from it. Um, there can be cognitive deficits and emotional problems as well. It's not just motor, although the motor is the most obvious. Um, you know, increasing levels of dopamine, at least in the beginning, can help. Um, and again, dopamine does not actually cross the blood-brain barrier, so they figured out ways to give people precursors for dopamine, like L-dopa, which can cross the blood-brain barrier, then increase dopamine levels in the brain. But eventually, as more and more of these neurons die, um, you know, it gets harder and harder to try to compensate. Um, but yeah, so when, when you hear about Parkinson's disease, it's these neurons here in the midbrain that are dying. And again, as they die, they are no longer doing their job of controlling the basal nuclei, the, you know, the corpus striatum of the, of the cerebrum, and it's starting to mess up your, mess up your nervous system. And um, one of the things I'll mention that's very fascinating is Parkinson's 
seems to be something that started or it did not seem to be recorded in any cases until after like the industrial age. Um, like if you go back, you read like, you know, things about from the Greeks from, you know, two over 2000 years ago, you know, Sinel people get old and they start getting all dotty in the second shot. There's a lot of, a lot of medical things, a lot of neurological things that even if they didn't have the names we give them now, you can recognize that, oh, that they maybe this person had that, or I recognize this or that, um, you know, from these recorded descriptions of patients from 500 years ago or 2000 years ago. Parkinson's is something that has very, very um, distinctive symptoms. And at least from the stuff I've read, um, you don't see anything described that looks similar to it until, you know, after the advent of the industrial age, when we started just putting all sorts of crap into the environment and things like that. Um, so there's a good, you know, it's probably some mix of genetics, but also it seems like some mix of how our nervous system interacts with ways, you know, things that exist in the environment now that didn't exist before we started like being kind of brainless about just dumping lots of chemicals that a lot of them are bioactive into the environment that kind of, you know, have effects on our neural development and other things. So yeah, I would say, yeah, kind of a cautionary tale. This, just because you don't see something having some obvious effect in the moment, making you sick doesn't mean it's not a bad thing. Um, but yeah, Parkinson's. There's, there's now some treatments for this and for other things that I don't know as much about, but I know are becoming practical therapeutics where they actually implant deep brain electrodes and kind of do low electrical stimulation, you know, which it sounds like an extreme kind of thing, but if somebody's quality of life is so low without it, you know, it, it can warrant doing that kind of thing and it can actually really improve people's quality of life. Um, so brainstem, midbrain, Colliculi, substantia nigra. I think that's what I want you to know for the midbrain. For the pons and the medulla, let me just put it on another page. I'm just going to group them together. You know, these are some of the real fundamental kind of keeping you alive. Cardiovascular control you know, blood pressure, um, you know, kind of heart rate, respiratory control, you know, like I said, the hypothalamus does work on these as well, but it controls them by modulating the pons and the medulla. When you get down here, this is where you literally have some little oscillator circuit that is just sending a little signal to your diaphragm like every few seconds to go, <sighs> right? For you to breathe, there has to be some action potentials coming down your phrenic nerve, you know, 15 times a minute or else you're gonna stop breathing. That little oscillator circuit sending those action potentials down to operate your diaphragm muscle or coming from the pons and the medulla. So that's what I'm saying, kind of the real low level control here. Um, coughing and sneezing are down here. You know, clearing out your airways. You know, if there's something blocking your upper or lower respiratory passages, <laughs> explosive blasts of air trying to free it up so you can breathe again. Um, emesis, that's a fancy word for? Vomiting. Pu puking. Yeah, puking, barfing, um, praying to the porcelain goddess. That's what we used to say in college, um, which, which was fun. This is going to college at Berkeley versus going to college on the East Coast. I was telling my friend, 
about praying to the porcelain goddess. And he's like, wow, in Pennsylvania, we pray to the porcelain god. <laughs> so I was like, oh, it's like, he's like, that's a really California kind of thing. <laughs> um, anyway, so, you know, again, if you've, if your body is being poisoned or tox, there's something toxic in you that you're trying to expel, Again, that doesn't matter if you are a lizard or a human, you're trying to get it out of your body. Um, talking about conditioned reflexes, remember, in fact, let me, when we were talking about reflexes, let me just bring this up just for a moment. Back, let me spell it better. You know, I talked about innate reflexes, the ones that are just programmed in automatically, like the stretch reflexes and the withdrawal reflex. And then we talked about conditioned reflexes, where you make an association with something that is now a learned reflex. This is like... This one is really connected to very strong conditioned learning. Um, if you associate feeling nauseous or sick or barfing with something, there's a good chance you're never gonna try it again or you're gonna just really avoid it, even if you don't know for sure that's what it was. Like it could have actually been just you got sick from some bad, um, mayonnaise but you you're pretty sure the scallops you had scallops that night and you think the scallops made you vomit you might never want to eat scallops again um, there's a very strong condition learning when you think something is toxic to your body to avoid it again which makes sense which totally makes sense um, and i should admit one of the interesting things when we get to emotions there's evidence that the emotion of disgust is actually layered on top of some of these more physiological, um, physiological circuits that are just more about expelling kind of toxins from your body. Um, you know, kind of like it's an emotional toxin, like you're seeing some horrible kids being molested or something, and it's just some gross thing that you've got to get out of your body. You know, people get all nauseous and vomit when they see things that are disturbing or disgusting. Um, it seems to actually be overlaid onto the circuits that are, you know, their initial, you know, originally to like expel actual kind of physiological toxins and stuff out of your body. Um, so that is, Again, medulla has like coughing and sneezing and vomiting, kind of core things to keep, keep you breathing, keep you not poisoned, things like that. Um, and there's other, there's relays. There's also, there's different areas in here where like your auditory information is going up and things like that. There, there's more things in there as well, but let's, let's just leave it there. Okay. Um, the one last part of the brain that I'll mention, so we had the pons, the medulla. I mentioned that on the back of the brainstem, you have the cerebellum. So let's, the cerebellum is like connected to the ponds by these little fiber tracks, the peduncles. So here's my little cerebellum. Again, cerebellum with a different word, not cerebrum, cerebellum. Um, it's pretty complicated as well. It has a cortex, it has little nuclei. Um, this seems to be involved mainly in kind of smooth coordinated motor um, functioning. Smooth coordinated movement. Um, it's getting information from all these different regions that we've been talking about that control your muscles. 
Plus it's connected to all the sensory stuff about where is your body and what is your body doing? We're gonna talk about proprioception, like angle of your joints and the you know, stretch on your muscles. So it's got information about what you want your body to do, the circuitry that controls your body, as well as the sensory information about the current physical status of your body. And it tries to kind of close the loop and make your body do what you want it to do. Um, like when people do like have damage to their cerebellum, you know, they're not gonna be paralyzed, but they're gonna have trouble placing their, their limb where they want it to be. Like a classic thing is, um, you know, here's, here's the stapler and I wanna grab the stapler and I reach for it, but I overreach. Oh shoot, I'm too far. Okay, I need to over, I need to correct. I gotta go back, but I overcorrect and I go back. And so I just kind of oscillate around where I want my hand to, to be rather than have it just get where I want it to be so I can get this thing. So that's like the kind of things you have when you have damage to the cerebellum. Um, you have trouble kind of closing the loop, like making your body do what you want it to do in a nice coordinated way. Like I've mentioned, like my original degree was in electrical engineering and designing control systems to operate robotic arms and stuff like that, among other things. And it's not easy to have a physical thing, move, accelerate, land where you want fast as possible without overshooting, without, you know, your brain does crazy cool calculations to operate your body and make you be able to run around in the world without, you know, you don't have to actually think about it too much unless something goes wrong. But when, yeah, when things do go wrong, you know, people, you start appreciating how much your brain is actually doing to take care of all the low level coordination of your musculoskeletal system. Um, so. So those are parts and pieces of the brain. There's two more things we'll talk about that are like systems of the brain, things that are not in any particular place that are a variety of interconnected places that are all involved in a common function. Um, I've been mentioning the limbic system. These are a variety of regions involved with emotional processing. You know, there is no one place where emotions are. Um, like we mentioned, we saw, we saw the amygdala is involved. What other places are involved with emotional processing? The prefrontal, prefrontal cortex. That's more, you can regulate stuff there. That's more about more intellect than emotions. Okay, the cingulate gyrus. Yes, yeah, cingulate gyrus. Yeah, in fact, that stuff I was talking about earlier, that emotional regulation, that's about like intellect kind of modulating the emotional regions, emotional responses. So like, what am I feeling versus like, what, do, what would I rather be feeling? <laughs> Um, amygdala, cingulate gyrus, we talked about the hippocampus just a little bit ago, obviously the hypothalamus, actually some parts of the thalamus itself. Um, there's fiber tracts that interconnect them, like the fornix goes between like the hippocampus and um, and the hypothalamus and stuff. So there's, there's also fiber tracks involved here. So the thing that's interesting about emotions though is you know, we don't have it as mapped out like this other stuff, like with vision, 
as talking about, oh, the visual processing is here and goes here, or, uh, you know, what does it mean, except for fear and anxiety, which we have some sense is correlated with amygdala activity, you know, it's still not clear exactly how it works or even what emotions look like in the brain in terms of the neural activity. You know, we know that if you mess with different parts, you can cause disruptions or changes or things going on in emotions, but we still don't really know what it means to be happy or sad or <laughs> um, again. And again, most emotions are even complicated. I'm like sad, but it's a beautiful sadness. And it's kind of, or it's like, you know, I'm horrified, but I'm also really stoked because I hated that guy or whatever. <laughs> you know, a lot of like, emotions get really complicated and messy as well. They're not even clean. So who knows, who knows what they look like in your brain. Um, so limbic system, whenever you see that word, it's just referring to a variety of different regions. Most of them are more near the midline of the brain. Um, they're closer to the center than the edges, but they're different and they're interconnected and they all seem to play a role in emotional, emotional processing. Um, the other system that we should mention is the reticular activating system. So this is an area in the, this are, I should say, areas in the brainstem. They're kind of different areas that connect and then project up this particular act, well, particular activating system. Like also there's the reticular formation or specific structures in there. They project into these upper brain regions, meaning they send axons and connect to parts of the brain further up. And these are responsible, you know, necessary for arousal. Arousal meaning not being asleep, not like sexually aroused or anything, just you know, aroused, uh, aroused being awake. Um, like when there is damage to the reticular activating system, people can end up in a coma. Like what is a coma? What's the difference between a coma and just being asleep? But there's no guarantee that you're going to wake up. Yeah, exactly. This is non-rousable sleep. Right? If we were in a, the actual classroom right now and I saw somebody fall asleep in the class and I wanted to be kind of a jerk, I could walk over and kick them. And they go, whoa, Oops, sorry about that. Uh, um, if someone was in a coma, you can kick them all you want and they're not going to wake up. Um, Right, so that's the, the difference between a coma and just being asleep is you can't wake somebody up from a coma. That's what, what's what makes them so, so bad. So damage to this reticular activating system, not having this activity, which is necessary for arousal means that the person stays in this sleep-like state. Um, yeah, so that's, I mean, it's partly it's worth knowing this reticular activating system because if some if you have some brain injury that affects it, it has very um, kind of dire consequences like that. Um, all right. So CNS, brain and spinal cord. Everything we've been saying so far is the brain, but we should mention the spinal cord a little bit because <coughs> it's, it's doing cool stuff. So spinal cord does some integration.
you know, we call the spinal reflexes. Like that stretch reflex that we saw does not need your brain. The sensory neuron synapsed in the spinal cord to a motor neuron, which went out to the muscle to make it flex. So even if there was no brain, you whack on somebody's knee, their leg's going to kick out. Those withdrawal reflexes as well. Um, things like we're going to talk about the reflexes around defecation and urination as your as your like rectum or bladder stretch out and you get the urge to pee or poop. That's happening just within the um, spinal cord. Erection. You can have somebody who is quadriplegic and is numb from the neck down and stroke their penis and they'll still have an erection. Even though they don't feel anything and they have no idea nothing's anything's happening to their body, but that reflex is still can be integrated in the spinal cord. Um, gait, some gait reflexes, walking. There are these horrible experimental preps, the, the cerebrate cat, where you basically have a cat that basically has it's completely been brain dead, but you put it on a treadmill and it'll still walk. Or you kind of tweak it and it'll scratch. You know, so there, there are some basic kind of reflexes like that, gait reflexes, muscle kind of posture reflexes, scratch a flea reflexes that can be integrated within the spinal cord rather than needing the brain. Um, if a reflex needs the brain, then it's called a cranial reflex. You know. You know, the reflex where you shine a light in your eye and your pupil constricts, that's a cranial reflex. That's happening. That's integrated in your brain. Um, you know, same thing with, um, yeah, I think the, ga the gag reflex as well. But some reflexes don't need the brain. They're, they're integrated in the neurons of the spinal cord. So because sometimes it's easy just to think of it as a big bunch of wires carrying messages in and out of the, of the brain, but it does have some integration going on. It is also a big bundle of axons going in and out of the brain. So there's both sensory, sensory nerves and motor nerves. You know, so carrying the messages, most of them are actually mixed. They're mixes of sensory and motor. And they come out all along and control the muscles at the different levels of your body, as well as taking in sensory information from the senses of your body and taking it up to the brain. So most of these are going both ways. Um, in anatomy, we go into much more detail, but I, I want to just bring in just a little bit of this. So all these spinal nerves. And again, if you've been in anatomy, you've learned about the, there's the um, cervical, there's a plexus, there's a cervical, there's a plexus up here, there's a brachial plexus, there's a lumbar plexus, a sacral plexus, all these different areas where they get nerves coming out. Um, the main ones we should know. So part of the reason physiologically why we care that these different nerves are coming out at different levels is when particularly younger people, you know, end up like getting spinal cord damage because they like jump off a bridge into two foot water because their prefrontal areas haven't developed well enough for them to realize that's an idiotic idea. Um, so it's not that uncommon actually for young, especially young males to end up getting like spinal cord damage. Um, where that severing happens makes a difference in what kind of deficits you're gonna see because all the messages below that aren't gonna get Get where they're going. 
If it's too high, um, the very top are cervical, um, cervical C3 through C5. That means cervical spinal nerve three through five, just the first few ones coming out at the very top of the spinal cord here. These give rise to what's called the phrenic nerve. The phrenic nerve is what is operating your, your diaphragm so you can breathe. This is what's carrying the messages from your brainstem down to the diaphragm, that muscle that drives your, your pulmonary ventilation. So if you have spinal cord damage above C3, you are screwed because that means you are not gonna be able to send messages down to your diaphragm and you're gonna stop breathing. So unless they put you on a like mechanical ventilator really quick, you're gonna just suffocate and die. Um, that's what like Christopher Reeve got. He had like horse accident and they did manage, but he was like on a ventilator for the rest of his life. Um, and most people who have damage there, they're kind of not, they're in trouble. There's like the little um, mnemonic, C3 through five, keep you alive, right? So if you have spinal cord damage below that, you're gonna keep breathing. So you're gonna be all right in terms of not dying from that. But if you're maybe around C8 is the beginning of the brachial plexus that goes to your arms. So if you are around C8, you'll still breathe, but you will be quadriplegic. You will have no ability to control your arms or lower or feel stuff from your arm, you know, from basically from your neck down. You know, below the brachial plexus, then you'll be like paraplegic. You'll have ability to operate your arms, but you won't have the lower part of your body, like the lumbar and sacral plexuses and stuff. So yeah, depending on where the damage is, you'll have different deficits. And also obviously sensory stuff, what you're gonna feel, the message is coming back up. And we'll also see this also is gonna affect not just your somatic motor, your voluntary motor, but it's connected to your, um, to your, autonomic motor. Like the sympathetic stuff is coming out through these spinal nerves as well. So you can like have like your sweat glands stop working at a certain level of your body, depending on where the damage is to your spinal cord, um, things like that. So just kind of putting out there, the spinal cord is, is worth paying attention to. Um, it's considered central nervous system to send in some integration and also is a place where you have all of these um, axons going up and down that give rise to the nerves. Again, the nerves are the bundles after they leave the spinal cord, right? Nerve just means bundle of axons outside the CNS. So the nerves are carrying the messages in and out to all the parts of the body. Once they are into the spinal cord, now it's considered part of the CNS. Um, all right, any comments, questions about any of that stuff? All right, so what we're gonna do now, let's um, take a break. Um, when we come back, um, we will do like some last questions and stuff, and then we will do our um, quiz. Make sure your computer is set up to do Proctorio. It's got the right browser going and got the right plugins installed and all of that. Um, otherwise, I will see you all at 1010 for the quiz. I do have a question. Uh -huh. Maybe I should ask it afterwards, but was the insula part of the limbic system too? Yeah, oh, thank you. No, thank you very much for, for saying that. Um, 
Yeah, if everyone can go back in their notes and um, add the insula to the limbic system, uh, that would be great. No, thank you, Sienna. I, I spazzed on that one. Yeah. Um, and like I said, the insula is an interesting player because it's also a part involved in just kind of the experience of your body, you know, your, your kind of physical self. And it's also very connected to emotions. So this this kind of blurring between what it, you know, what it feels like in your emotions and what it feels like in your body, you know, obviously right. you get very blurred. Like visceral. Yeah, the visceral feeling of like, you know, you're scared and your heart's speeding up and you're feeling kind of like a pit in your stomach and you're, um, you know, it's, you know, the, yeah, there, there's, there's, there's a lot of blur. Again, some of them, there's also some emotions that get very, very like less visceral, like, but, uh-huh, John? Isn't the insula also involved in taste, gustation? Uh, yeah, I think it is, yeah. I always thought that was cool that that obviously plays into emotions too. Yeah, no, it's true. When we get to the, no oh, I should mention, um, I'll mention it later when we do olfaction, but kind of back to the thalamus. I talked about the thalamus being the sensory relay station. The thalamus is the sensory relay for all the senses, except, I mean, it does some of your olfaction, some of your smell, but smell actually has some some kind of connections up into the brain that don't go through the thalamus. It's the only sense that has this more kind of direct wiring into the brain without kind of going through this relay center. So smell more than anyone seems to be really deeply connected into kind of these deeper brain functions. Mm -hmm. um, but taste, taste as well. But and then, yeah, so it's, yeah, we'll, we'll talk about smell more a little later, but I thought, I think that's interesting. Yeah, obviously emotions are complicated and get connected into and tied into all sorts of things. Um, and then, again, there's still things that are not that well understood and they're connected to memories. We're gonna talk about that. Yeah, probably not today, but um, you know, the hippocampus, which is at the core of memories, is also at the core of emotions. Um, so if there is a strong emotional valence to something, you're more likely to set it as a long-term memory that you're not gonna forget for a long time. Um, so there's, there's all sorts of interconnections between these different things we're talking about. Do we talk about something like nostalgia? That, I don't know, probably not about that. We'll talk about different cool things about memory, but why one particular memory has, it's, it's I'm, I could speculate that it's about mm -hmm. connecting a positive emotion to an old memory. And now that life is so, yeah, I, yeah, now that life is so crazy and difficult and the world is so much less, you know, yeah, it's such a trickier place to navigate then you just kind of remember things that when you felt like less, less um, stressed by every little thing and then you have very fond memories of it. I think it's probably just something like that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, nostalgia is crazy. It's like yeah, people pay just tons of money for some little stupid doohickey that they had as a kid that reminds them of kind of the simpler easy days of life but it, it gets weird in terms of the whole you know kind of scheme of what 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 val what is value what has value like some things you're shocking you go on ebay and it's like holy crap that is worth so much money now <laughs> for like a gremlin's lunchbox <laughs> it's yeah it's funny yeah, that's why we talked about humans are not always rational. Decision-making, sometimes buying that gremlin's lunchbox for $300 mm -hmm. 
doesn't make sense on a pragmatic level, but on an emotional level, it makes sense. <laughs> so I, 